I officially retired from RIT in 2013, which meant that that was when I stopped teaching full time, but I would go on to work about half time for the next four years. In the summer of 2014, RIT threw me a very nice retirement party, but there was no recording of that event. However, I had these great pictures of all the happy people uh, from the party, and I decided to try and reproduce the talk I gave. I have the slides from that talk. And so this is a reproduction from the, uh, the talk and superimposed on top of all of the great pictures from the, uh, the event. I want to particularly thank uh, the Rakenos. I think Rolo took most of the pictures, and Nina was busy uh, doing the audiovisuals for the, uh, the presentations. There were uh, a bunch of speakers ahead of me. Many of the pictures were the, uh, the happy faces from the roasting I was taking from uh, the uh, folks who spoke ahead of me. Uh, here's a list of them in particular. Uh, Ed Prisbilowitz served as the Master of Ceremonies. He'd been the director of the center for a couple of years and become a good friend. My very long-term uh, friend and professional associate, Daryl Williams, came and gave a very uh, nice talk. Daryl had been head of the uh, Landsat uh, science team for uh, many years, but he was also a uh, uh, supporter of my very early work at uh, Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories. Bernie Brower, a former student uh, who was at uh, Exilus Corporation, now Harris, gave a uh, very humorous talk about the, uh, the things that he had uh, experienced in his time at RIT. He was one of my master's students. Uh, Ron Fairbanks uh, from Integrity Applications uh, came back from Washington to, uh, to do a little roasting. Uh, Jackie Spear, one of my few students who's gone on to academia, most of them won't go to industry. Jackie came back to, uh, to tell us some of her stories of her time at, at uh, RIT. And then three of my colleagues from RIT, Carl Savaggio, Scott Brown, and Emmett Antolucci, had a very good time of uh, giving me a, a bit of a, a hard time. But on with the story. Uh, I want to start before the beginning and tell the story in, in decades. And uh, it may be an apocryphal story, but uh, it begins with a basket. When I was an infant, the uh, family moved half a block down into a new house. Uh, it was a house that uh, I would grow up in and the house that uh, my parents would live the rest of their lives in. And the story goes that uh, since it was just a half a mile, they were just tossing things in cars and, and small trucks. And I ended up taking the, uh, the trip in a basket, a laundry basket. Now, a laundry basket in those days wasn't the uh, plastic uh, basket that we think of today, but it was a, a peach basket like this one with a lining in it. And so the story the story is going to include some of the, the things that happened to me as a youth, and so I thought I'd start with that little basket story. But that's not the basket that uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, and it may be an apocryphal story anyways. But apocryphal is an important word here because I would tell my students stories uh, as I lectured, and uh, they have a horrible sense of timing and history. So I mentioned the Second World War, and invariably somebody would come up to me afterwards and say, were you in the Second World War? Even though I was born five or six years after it ended. So anyways, I want to tell you a story about my youth. When uh, you were a kid, you, you talked to your buddies, and you talk about uh, what you'd like to do when you grew up. And old Mose and I would uh, spend time when we were drifting in our baskets talking about what we wanted to do when we grew up. And of course, he had these dreams of being a great leader and having these adventures wandering in the desert. And I came from a working class family and would tell them stories about, you know, I really like the science stuff. I grew up in the uh, space age, the space race, and uh, read stories as a kid about uh, young people solving adventures, working with scientists, and uh, I thought maybe I wanted to be somebody who would work with scientists. Uh, pushing it much beyond that was, was sort of a big step for a, 
a kid whose family, nobody whose family had uh, gone to college, but uh, you know, I said I wanted to be a scientist. Well, I had a lot of help along the way. Uh, these are some pictures of my family, my three sons in the top right there. Uh, the fun one of my mom and dad in the black and white uh, center top, and uh, that's them a few decades later sitting on the benches at our cottage in Canada. Always had support from my, my parents and my family. Bottom right there is myself with my siblings who are all here tonight. And the bottom left one is Pam and I and our uh, three boys, my daughter-in-law Julia and my granddaughter Erin, who's also in her bathing suit there at the beach at the top left. Got a lot of support from the, the family, a lot of encouragement to, uh, to do science as I grew up. And I got my first opportunity at what we're going to talk about is the, the first decade when uh, I got an opportunity to work at what was then Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories in Buffalo and is now Calspan. And that's a picture from my uh, photo ID at the time, what I looked like when I went for my job interview. And somehow I still managed to, uh, to land the job. Calspan, Cornell in those days, was one of the few places in Buffalo where you could do serious science. It was a major research center and uh, contract research uh, corporation. And uh, I went to work with them in, uh, in 72 after I'd finished my junior year in college, uh, worked as a summer job convinced them to hire me for a part-time job through my senior year, and then went to work for them full-time after my senior year. I got a chance to work with some truly exceptional scientists. So my dream had been to, to work with some scientists, maybe help out in that as a career. And I found myself working with two guys named Ken Peach and John Walker, and I didn't realize it at the time. It took me a while to, to learn uh, the field. But I had, by accident, got to work with some of the greats of the field. These guys were trying to figure out how could you take quantitative measurements with aerial and satellite photographs and make physical measurements analytically in a time when most people were looking at aerial and satellite images and just using their eyeballs to try and see what they could see. And so I got into the beginnings with some great folks, got to do some really fascinating work. These are bottom left, there's a picture of uh, one of Ken Peach's projects, shining a laser at uh, the Skylab space station, the precursor of today's space station. And the picture top right is astronauts who would look out the window and basically take a photograph and so we could study the potential of using lasers as ground-based location systems and also to understand the atmospheric effects. I also got my first start on one of my own big projects. In the top left there, I won a NASA contract to, uh, to study uh, Great Lakes temperatures and water quality from uh, one of the new NASA satellites at the time. So I'm pretty excited here. I, I got the first step of my dream. I'm doing science and having a, uh, an opportunity to work with some, some pretty great scientists. After a few years, uh, Johnny Walker died suddenly, and uh, we were left with just Ken Peach and I as the principal scientists at uh, the lab. And then Ken decided to, uh, to move to a competitor, and uh, I was asked to head the research group at, uh, in remote sensing there at uh, Kelspan and decided uh, that meant spending most of my time raising money, which is not exactly what I wanted to do. And I was at the time being recruited by uh, RIT. So in 1980, uh, Kelspan threw me a nice party. I was one of the few people to, uh, to leave by my own choice when they were shrinking rapidly after the Vietnam War. And, uh, they left, I left on good terms. I was able to take all of my equipment with me. I was able to uh, 
subcontract some of my ongoing work to pay myself at RIT, and in return, I also subcontracted back to CalSpan from some of the new programs I brought in, brought in at RIT. So we continued to work between uh, RIT and CalSpan closely for a couple of years, over which time I ended up hiring away the, the people who were left at CalSpan who wanted to, uh, to do remote sensing, and they came and helped me get things started at, uh, at RIT. When I got to RIT, I found out that uh, they had recruited me, uh, I guess, maybe somewhat under false pretenses. Maybe I was just a 29-year-old kid and not very sophisticated, having not looked at the, the place very carefully. But I, I got there. They recruited me to, uh, to help build a PhD program in imaging science. And I found when I got there that, uh, of course, image science didn't have a PhD program, but neither did the university have one anywhere. And uh, they also hired me to start doing more research. Again, I found out that imaging science didn't do research, but neither did the university as a whole, by and large. But I was there and decided I would try and get things going. I had a lot of help uh, in those early days from Debbie Stendardi in the top right in this uh, slide, and uh, Rich Rose, who was uh, the president at the time and really wanted to get uh, research started and would eventually be very supportive of the PhD. To get things started, though, we, we had to uh, sell a lot of work from a place that didn't do any work. And I quickly found out that in the digital age that was coming on strong, my analog equipment that I had brought with me wasn't going to be of all that much use. Uh, so we uh, worked out a deal to uh, get a return of some of the overhead, particularly from the contracts I had brought in from uh, CalSpan. We got some overhead recovery money in and we bought a digital imaging process, digital imaging processing system and uh, started doing work in all sorts of areas outside of remote sensing, which was what we were supposed to do uh, in what we call our going into business sale. And this was because everybody who did imaging wanted to process digital images. We had one of these expensive uh, in those days, particularly very expensive early image processing systems. So we did a, a lot of work uh, in a, a range of areas, as you can see here, from uh, skin care to echocardiography, looking at radiators coming down assembly lines, as well as stuff closer to remote sensing, looking at the heat loss from, from buildings, both overhead and from the, the street level. Well, I want to introduce a couple of the players from that era, Ron Francis in particular. Ron recruited me. He was the chairman of the, what was in those days the photographic science department. Uh, Russ Krauss was also involved in, in the recruiting process. He was the head of the school of photography where we were housed in those days. And Russ in particular uh, was uh, interested in, and realized we had to do a bunch of research if we were going to move to a PhD. And he uh, helped me get started and work the uh, issues to get research going. Bill Brower up there top right uh, helped form the center, was really instrumental in uh, the Center for Imaging Science coming into being and became a, a good friend over the years. Bob Desmond was uh, the director and then the dean and then the associate provost through all the years where we were building the PhD program, another really big help. And Rodney Shaw uh, had held the head, the center, director of the center in the period of the uh, time when the PhD was brought online and when the building was built. And then Bob Johnson uh, took over after Rodney left. And Bob's an important player, an interesting player. Bob was a, a dean of the College of uh, Fine and Applied Arts and uh, an archaeologist by training. He's sitting in one of the caves from where the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in this particular image. Bob had uh, made a bunch of zero radiographs uh, of these tablets, these clay tablets from the Babylonian era that were wrapped in clay. And you take these zero radiographs and get these really fuzzy pictures of the uh, cuneiform writing on the inside. And he had come to me when we had our going into business sale and said, you know, can you do anything here? And we would digitize the images and uh, sharpen them and help him uh, develop better ways to see and read this writing in the inside of these uh, antiquities. So he would eventually join the center as the, the director in the period when we just needed somebody to fill in as boss. 
and then continued for many years doing research with, uh, in particular, Roger Easton at the center looking at uh, antiquities. I put these up mostly because there's a period here, a long period, where we had many, many uh, directors, and I worked for a whole bunch of people over the years. And speaking of people, here's a, a crew from that uh, era of the, uh, the early 80s. Uh, I won't go into any details there, but those of you from around the center will recognize the, the Ricanos. And uh, one of my very first uh, graduate students, Joe Beagle, shows up here on uh, in at least uh, three different places at, at various stages of his uh, uh, career. I'm going to step ahead to the, the next decade, the 90s, so the 80s was building the PhD, work, working at uh, a series level, building a, a laboratory. The 90s, I really wanted to change my sights of what, what we wanted to do and, and aim a little higher and uh, try to build a group that worked at the, the national level and was, was the first place that people would turn to when they look for graduates and for research in the area of quantitative remote sensing. In the top left, there's a guy who uh, helped a lot through this period, uh, Al Simone. He was the president of the university at the time. And during the, the 90s, we did indeed uh, step up to that goal. We worked with uh, all of the folks you see on this page, the logos, but many, many more. We worked with the intelligence community, the, the civil community, uh, most of the big aerospace industries, and started to, uh, to really begin to work at the, uh, truly at the national level. Of course, it was all about graduate students, and here's a few pictures of, of some of the graduate students. This is why we did everything we did was to, to educate the students. But I want to tell a story about one in particular. In the top left there is uh, Julia Barsi talking to uh, Sue Chan, who's our uh, guidance counselor, for, for lack of a better word. She helped the students figure out all the issues of the campus. But Julia's an example of how well we were doing with our graduate students. When, when she got ready to graduate, she came to me and said, uh, you know, I asked her the typical questions. Uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to work for government? Do you want to work for industry? Do you want to work for a big company or a little company? Is there some geographic area that you're particularly interested in? And uh, she said, well, you know, I, I kind of like to work for NASA. I got interested in the stuff that we were doing for my research and, you know, I'd like to work for NASA. And I said, well, a big place. Maybe we can find you a placement there. And she said, well, I really want to work for NASA Goddard in Maryland. I said, okay. And, uh, and she said, well, uh, I think I really want to work for the Landsat office. So uh, I'd like to work on the Landsat program. So I said at this point, yeah, Julia, can you be a little more specific about what you want to do? Uh, well, anyways, we were, we were lucky. I'd done a lot of work with... Uh, NASA over the years, and in particular with the Landsat program. And I called my friend Daryl Williams, who uh, was the head of the project at the time, and uh, he's also here tonight, uh, and uh, said, Daryl, I got this young lady who'd like to come work for you. And, and his response was pretty much instantaneous. He said, well, the last student we hired worked out so great. I'm uh, happy to take a chance on your recommendation. And so we placed Julia right there where she wanted to, to be. I should point out that all of our students get, didn't get placed quite that precisely, but it's indicative of how easy it was to, uh, to place the students given what we were doing. This was not the, the best time. These 90s were not the best time for the center. We had a lot of trouble uh, internally. Uh, I'd gone on sabbatical to, uh, to write uh, this textbook that came out in the late 90s. And uh, while I was away, the uh, disgruntlement within the faculty that had been brewing for a while uh, seemed to explode. And we had faculty uh, going after each other and after the administration and uh, a pretty tough time uh, in the center. Now, I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, I'm happy to say that the uh, the purpose of writing the book was to increase the visibility of the center, and that was became very effective. We came out with a second edition and, and more and started my, my writing career, putting out a, a bunch of, uh, of books over the years. Well, as the faculty 
uh, went after each other. Uh, Al Simone hired a uh, gentleman who would be our next director, Ed Prisbilowitz, with the, uh, the charter to either uh, sort out the center or uh, shut it down. But luckily for us, Ed was an absolutely tremendous uh, boss and uh, also became a good friend. And he helped us sort out the issues in the center, uh, also put together the strategic plan uh, for the center at the time, which is still the operating basis uh, for the center. And so we ended up surviving those tough times and, uh, and moving forward. It was also a, a period where we would, after Ed, go through a, a fairly quick change of directors until we brought in Steffi Baum in 2011. And Steffi uh, has uh, been here through a period of long period of stability and is, and is still uh, the director today. So uh, I want to thank Steffi for helping put on this, uh, this going away party for me, but also for all of her service uh, to the center. We'll start the, the fourth decade here. Uh, a couple of things happened. Um, I was named the Weedman Professor, named after uh, the parents of uh, Fred Weedman, who was the, uh, the donor. Frederick and Anna B. Weedman were his parents. And this let me uh, free up some uh, time and most, mostly resources to help grow some additional um, graduate work. Uh, and also it represented a time in the center where we had a major change from uh, the perspectives, the sort of tight infighting perspectives of the previous decade to uh, a period where we could hire a new faculty in remote sensing. Up until this point, the faculty had not wanted there to be a, any additional remote sensing faculty. And all of a sudden that log jam burst and uh, we added uh, several new faculty and were able to dramatically expand both the faculty, staff, and students uh, who would uh, help us take on the next challenge uh, from my uh, dreams with Moses to uh, build the, uh, the best in the nation uh, remote sensing program. Big help to this was uh, Bill Dessler up there in the top left, the new RIT president uh, who would go on following Al Simone's uh, footsteps of supporting us to, uh, to take on this, this next challenge. This next image is just uh, typical of the kind of uh, work we were doing. This is a bunch of the, the students and staff under that uh, very modern aircraft that was uh, taking data that day. They'd been out taking uh, uh, measurements underneath the aircraft, which is flying actually, although an old aircraft, a very advanced sensor. Uh, and it's typical of what we were doing to make this national stage for ourselves. Uh, most remote sensing programs had, uh, when the world went digital, they had gone into the business of just getting the, the digital images from places like NASA and analyzing the images. And I had uh, pushed and with the support of the team at Remote Sensing Group, we had pushed collectively to try and stay in the business of building and operating uh, field instruments, aerial instruments, and uh, teaching our students how to touch physically the, the instrumentation that was so critical to the business we were in, particularly because so many of our students would go on to either the aerospace industry where they would be building instruments or the government where they would be buying expensive instruments and uh, satellite instruments in particular. And we thought it was important that uh, some place in the country continued to uh, teach students how to work with the equipment. That's not to say that we didn't do a lot of analyses of, of images also, but we wanted to include in our process the, the physical process of building them. Well, how did we do? What was our report card in all of these efforts to grow to be the first first class operation as well as eventually uh, strive to be the best in the country. Well, it's easy to measure money. So we measure money. The top chart, right chart here is uh, growth in uh, annual 
research dollars. And you can see we grew slowly. The, the gap in the middle there is not that we stopped working. It was during those bad years when I got ticked off with the administration, didn't bother to put out any reports to record how much we did. But I, I know that we continued to grow through that period. And we got up to the point where we were doing about a half million dollars worth of, of research. But I was the only faculty member still through all that period. And then we brought in Mike Richardson, who was my uh, administrative lead in uh, about 1999. And Mike took on all the parts of the job that I didn't like. He liked to work with numbers. He liked to do the matrix management. And Mike took over uh, essentially all the parts of the job that I didn't like to do and uh, freed me up to do far more direct management of the research. And so he did what he liked to do. I did what I like to do. And we very quickly doubled our research volume. Uh, and then we doubled again. Uh, this wasn't all me. A lot of this was also the fact that the same era, we brought in other faculty members. And Mike also served as the administrator uh, for their projects. And so we, we grew rapidly uh, up to where we are now doing three and a half, four million dollars in research a year. More importantly, it's the bottom chart where you see the rapid growth in uh, people, both faculty, staff, and students, but particularly students. We were able to grow to a point where we typically have 30 plus graduate students working in the group now. And of course, graduate students do all the work. And so this is uh, a huge growth, one of the largest programs of its type in the country. I can't give a talk like this without addressing one of the most important programs we ever developed here. And this is a program called DeerSig. DeerSig is a uh, image simulation tool that we started building way back in the 80s uh, to look at what would the world look like when viewed by a new sensor. So it's a simulation modeling tool where you include a geometric and physical description of the world, a geometric and physical description of the imaging and uh, atmospheric conditions and a uh, geometric and physical simulation of the particular sensor that you want to model looking at the world. And you end up generating, uh, today anyways, very uh, realistic looking images of what a sensor might see and what a sensor you might not even have built yet would see so that the government in particular could say, before I spend a half a billion or a couple billion dollars building this satellite instrumentation, what's it going to look like? Is it going to work? Is it going to do the job I want it to do? And I want to point out the, the folks who built this the center bottom there is Carl Salvaggio. Carl was the lead uh, in the early days of the DeerSig development. And when he left, uh, Scott Brown, bottom right there, took over the, uh, the DeerSig development and is still leading DeerSig development today. And they've taken it from a, a very crude simulation and modeling tool to an impressive tool today that is used all over the country by uh, government and aerospace agencies. And uh, RIT now dominates this field with, with this particular tool. Well, I want to move on to the, the last decade, this decade we're in. Uh, and uh, we've gone through a phase that we call the passing of the baton. We literally gave Dave Messenger, top left there, the uh, baton when uh, he took over heading the remote sensing group. And uh, Emmett Antolucci there is taking over my radiometry uh, responsibilities. The, the bat is from the, the famous bat problems that we give to the, uh, the students at the end of the radiometry courses. And several other faculty members have taken over uh, teaching my remote sensing courses. And I'm happy to be saying that I'm passing up on those things and just continuing to do some research and working with uh, my graduate students. And that's probably my proudest achievement in my years here at RIT that I've worked with over 100 uh, masters and doctoral students, getting them not only their degrees, but essentially, in all cases, helping them get a uh, start in their careers. I want to close with some thank yous in particular. I want to, uh, to thank Amanda Zeloff, who helped put this party together uh, behind my back. I knew they were throwing a party, but I didn't realize it had grown to the, uh, the proportions that it has. And to uh, Steffi Baum, who uh, helped support the, uh, the whole uh, dinner tonight and uh, 
let Amanda have her free hand in putting this together. And I particularly want to thank Pam, who has been my support through all of these changes in my dreams as I dreamed a little bigger and a little broader and has encouraged me and uh, stood by me through all of this. Thank you very much.